Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The administration of justice requires absolutely that certain men render judgment on other men. It seems to me that these judges can become so burdened by this responsibility that their lives become very nearly insupportable, provided they are men of conscience. And the man whose story we now bring you is indeed a man of conscience. And his life, at this time, well nigh insupportable. Our mystery drama, The Man Must Die, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars William Prince and Christopher Tabori. It is sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The Right Honorable Joseph Bailey is 50 years old, has a wife and a son, Jack, age 18. The judge is a man of both strength and sensitivity, a fine combination in anyone, but most especially in a man who holds and must exercise the power to dispose of the futures and sometimes the very lives of others. We first meet Judge Bailey at a time when his life has become almost indeportable. And don't eat so fast, Joe. You know what it does to you. I don't want any more coffee, Ellen. Why not? What's the matter with it? Nothing's the matter with it. I just don't want any more. But you always have two cups. Well... This morning, I don't. Oh. This is the day, isn't it? This is the day. I know you've been dreading it. You can say that again. Well, now, dear, don't you think that just because this is the day, you should start it off right? Now, relax and enjoy your breakfast and, well, maybe a good, brisk walk to the courthouse? I was planning on walking. It's a lovely day. Joseph, don't eat so fast. Now, have I you? want to get started. But it's early. You don't want to hang around down there, do you? No. I don't want to hang around here, either. Why not? Oh, because of him. Because of him. I don't think he's even out of bed yet. Oh, yes, he is. I he moving around. Well, in that case... But I don't know what you're going to do with your time. Court doesn't begin until ten. I'll get some coffee. Oh, it's my heart to have you drink cheap coffee when you could be drinking mine. I'll do some reading in my chambers. You're too wrought up to do any reading, I can tell. Well, I'll do something. Anything's better than being here when Jack's downstairs. I simply cannot go through that one more time. I cannot. Well, you'd better hurry. I think I hear... Where's my coat? It's in the closet. Where else would it be? Oh, oh yes. Now, don't move. No, I, I won't. You always do the right thing. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you think so. Bye, dear. Now, take care. Father. You, you, you talk. I will. Father. Sneaked off, didn't he? Now, that's no way to talk about your father, Jack. Didn't want to face me. Come now, have your breakfast. Didn't want to listen to me. Your father has heard enough out of you, Jack. I shouldn't have to remind you that your father is quite capable of making his decisions without your help. He's done it on his own for a good many years. This man's a murderer. I know that. And your father knows that. It's not the first murder trial your father's presided over. Decided. Is it going to be death or the penitentiary? Well, I have no idea what he's decided. I, I don't even know that he has decided. He may very well be thinking it over. That's probably what he's doing right now. But he must have given you some idea which way he's leaning. <laughs> Eat your egg, Jack, before they get cold. Hasn't he? No. I don't believe you. I don't like to be talked to that way, Jack. Now, eat your egg. You mean he hasn't said anything to you about an important case like this? Well, your father never discusses any of his cases with me, important or unimportant, until they're disposed of. This case? A man murdering his father? All I know about it is what I've read in the papers. And the man wasn't his father. He was his adoptive father. Oh, uh, same thing. Well, it's not even clear that the man adopted he took him from the orphanage at age 14 and put him to work on his farm as he'd done with three other boys before and, and did with two more after. Yes, but he raised them, gave them a home. And... Yes, and he never had to pay a cent to a hired hand. You ever think of that part of it? Are you trying to say it was all right to bash his head in with a shovel just because he made his kids do a little work? Of course I'm not saying that it was all right. You're on his side, aren't you? Whose side, for heaven's sake? Father's side. Your father isn't on any side. You think... The murderer should get away with it? Jack! Now, I refuse to discuss this with you. I absolutely refuse. 
don't blame your father for running out of the house. Well, that's what he did, isn't it? Ran out. Because he didn't want to listen to another one of your harangues, and I don't want to hear another one either. Now, this is your father's decision. It is part of his job. And it's no very pleasant part either. So, well, I'll thank you to leave it to him and not to butt in. <sighs> now, if you don't want those eggs, hand them over to me. I'll eat them myself. Uh, take them. I, I don't want them. Well, pour yourself some coffee at least. No, I don't want any. Where are you going? Well, first I'm going to get dressed. And then I'm going down to that courthouse. Jack, don't do that. I want to hear this decision. You leave your father alone. I'm not going near him. How could I? He's unapproachable. How could I do anything to him? He's untouchable. He's the judge. The final word belongs to him. That's right. And that's as it should be. I just want to be there to hear him pronounce that final word. But why, Jack? Why? Why do you care so much? Because, Mother, this man, this murderer, has got to die. Can't you get that through your head? Has got to die. Show your passes, please. I'm Jack Belly. See your pass, please. I'm Jack Bailey. Judge Bailey is my father. Oh, you're the judge's son. Now, that's what I've been trying to tell you. Well, in that case, I I'll have just go in. special instructions. You're not to be admitted. He doesn't want you in a courtroom. He left particular instructions to that effect. Left instructions with who? With me personally, sir. Did he say why? Didn't say and didn't inquire. In this building, a judge's word is law. <laughs> Mother! Mother! For heaven's sake, what is it? He barred me from the courtroom. Can you imagine that? Yes. Do you know... Do you know he was going to do that? No. He had no right. Oh, he had every right. It's his courtroom. What was he afraid of? Well, you know perfectly well what he was afraid of, that you'd make a scene. And probably you would have the state you've been in. I feel very strongly about this. That man should be punished for taking a life. He will be. He should give his own life in exchange for the life he took. Well, you know what the Supreme Court said about I that. I don't care what the Supreme Court said. Twenty states permit capital punishment, and ours is one of them. Twenty states are trying to get around the Supreme Court decision. Now, it remains to be seen. The very what... least Father could have done is go on record that he's against the Supreme Court and for the state law. Well, maybe he will. he better. Well, you'd better watch how you talk about your father. And watch your attitude toward him, too. When will he be home? I don't know. He didn't say. The sentence will be in the afternoon paper. Yes, I imagine so. What time does that come out? About noon, something like that. Uh, it's almost 11.30. I'm going out to buy one. Oh, Jeff, for heaven's sake, it's not out yet. Not for half an hour at least. Now, Donnie, sit down, cool off. I can't. Why in the world is this case so important to you? I, I, I can't for the life of me figure it out. Don't you understand? The whole mess we're in... The whole mess the world is in. You did it. Me? I did it? Oh, no, 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 not you personally. Your generation. Oh. The generation of permissiveness. Bleeding hearts, understanding, tolerance, all that bilge. You swallowed it whole. You poisoned the world with all that compassion stuff. You raised me on it. I never saw anything wrong with the way we raised you. When I flunked out of college, you sent me to Paris, to art school. <laughs> Didn't you like Paris or art school? Of course I liked it. That's not the point. Well, what is the point? I wasn't supposed to flunk out of school. No, <laughs> but you did. What were we supposed to do about it? You were supposed to let me get away with it. But you'd already gotten away with it. You're back in school now. I, I, I don't see that any harm was done. That's not the point. It's the principle of the thing. Nobody is supposed to get away with anything. Oh, Jack, Jack. Oh, I'd hate to have that principle applied to everything I've done. I'm going out to see if that afternoon paper's on the stand. It isn't. Well, if it isn't, I'll go back to the courthouse. Somebody down there ought to be able to tell me what happened. Now, Jack. Oh. Jack, you came home. May I come in? Yes, sure. Sure. Well, you uh, want to know what the sentence was? Of course I want to know. Twenty years to life. You didn't... I didn't sentence him to death. No, I didn't. Now I'm going upstairs and lie down. Wait a minute. Wait one little minute. Jack, please. You can spare me a minute, can't you? Uh, I suppose I can. How do you justify what you did? You mean not sending the man to be killed? He can get out of jail in 20 years, you know. 
If he behaves himself, I know. He can get out and kill somebody else? But I don't think he will. You don't think? You're willing to take a chance because you don't think he will. Well, what else can I go on but my own demon? How do you know he won't kill somebody? I don't. Any more than I know he won't. Or you won't. Or anybody else won't. <laughs> Except possibly your mother, and I can't give you any guarantee about her if it comes to that. Now, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like you've done a terrible thing. I, I, I don't think so. And you're going to regret it. I, I hope not. Well, you will. You'll see. When you're responsible for another murder, you're going to be very, very sorry for what you've done. Jack, Jack, please. If he kills somebody else, you'll be responsible. You'll be the murderer yourself. That, don't you? Jack, stop it. It's all been decided. It's over. Now, there's nothing more to be said or done. Nothing more to be said or done. That's right. Nothing more to be said. Nothing more to be done. Nothing, dear. So... We'll see. We'll just wait and see about that. Arguments between parents and their children are nothing new. Actually, they dominate the years the children are growing up. It is not until the child has left the parent's home and has his own home, produced his own children, that the passion subsides and the arguments turn into discussions. And even then, there smolders beneath the acquired courtesy and the polished tact, the ancient hostilities and the basic antagonisms of the earlier years. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Nearly a month has passed since Judge Joseph Bailey sentenced a confessed murderer to 20 years to life. A month since his son Jack denounced him as worse than irresponsible for not having sent the murderer to his death. Since his wife Helen said to their son, there's nothing more to be said, nothing more to be done. A month since the boy replied, wait and see. Since that day, an unidentifiable mood has permeated the Bailey home. A mood which neither mother nor father nor son can break. You need more butter. Oh, I can make this do. No, muffins need plenty of butter. Helen, why doesn't Jack come down for breakfast anymore? Oh, really, it's up to him, Joseph. We can't make him. A month ago, I was avoiding him, and now he's avoiding me. Well, ever since the sentencing of that man. He's been different. No bother to deny it. He's been completely different. I wasn't going to deny it, though. Maybe I wouldn't say completely. It's... Well, he's been different. I, I thought by now... I thought so, too. I'll be in my study if you want me. I have some briefs to go over and probably take all morning. Well, I won't want you because I'm finally going to put up those peaches that I bought a week ago. Or they'll go bad. I'll see you, Ron. Lunchtime. Yes, yes. Mother! Oh! oh! Oh, Jack, you startled me. Sorry. My head's full of dishes and everything. Don't you sneak up on me while I have my hands full of dishes. Don't ever do that again. Okay, I won't do that again. And pour yourself some coffee, dear. Oh, and there's muffins, but you'll need butter. I'll bring it. Mother, sit down and... I want to clear the table. I want to tell you something. Oh, come on. Put the dishes down. Oh, dear. Well, all right. What is it? I've made up my mind about something. Oh, what's that? I'm going to see that man. What man? That murderer. You know which one. That man is in jail. Well, of course he's in jail. Father put him there. Why do you want to see him? I want to ask him a few things. Like what? Oh, how he feels, walking around alive after he's killed a man, eating and sleeping and enjoying life. <sighs> I rather doubt that he's enjoying life. Well, he's living, isn't he? And the man he killed isn't. Jack, you realize, don't you, that this man has gotten to be an obsession with you. Oh, no, it's not the man. It's the fact that he's alive. I want to know if he's feeling any remorse for what he did, if he regrets it, if he feels any sense of guilt at all. I think you can take it for granted that he feels all those things. Oh, but how do I know? For sure, unless I ask him. I'm sure your father won't approve. I can't help that. Well, when are you planning to go to see this man? I thought 
Now. Today? This morning. Oh, Jack, you've got to think about it. I've thought about it for weeks. Jack, please, now, please, don't rush into this. Please, talk to your father or somebody. Don't just go tearing off... Sorry. Of... I'll be back sometime. What makes you think they'll even let you in? Why, I'm the son of the right honorable Joseph Bailey. That ought to get me in anywhere, don't you think? Except, of course, into his precious courtroom. Jack, wait, wait. Let That's me right. ask him. Sorry. Jack? Jack! Oh. Joseph? Oh, yes, Helen? I had to disturb you, dear. Oh, that's all right. Darling, Jack came downstairs right after you came in here. Well, didn't I just hear him yes, go out? Yes, and that's why I had to disturb you. You'll never guess where he's gone. He's gone to see that man. You know, the murderer. He's, he's gone down to the jail to talk to him. Talk to him? <laughs> About what? About his feelings, he said. Whether, whether he feels sorry that he did what he did, whether he feels remorse or guilt, all that... Joseph, I tried to stop him, but I really didn't quite realize till the very last minute that he actually meant it. That he meant to go now. He hardly listened to me, and, and before I knew it, he was out the door. Don't worry about it, Ellen. They won't let him in. They won't? Oh, I wonder. Well, of course they well, won't. He seemed to think that being your son, all he had to do was mention your name. <laughs> I don't think my name impresses the warden too much. Oh, not in his own bailiwick where he made the Well, that's a relief. Another thing that worried me, I I, I didn't think if, if they did let him in that the man would be too happy to talk to him. Not if he knew how Jack felt about his... Oh, about his being put away instead of being executed. He might refuse to see him, but I don't think he'd hurt him. Well, if the warden won't let him in... <laughs> he won't. Well, then I'll let you go back to your reading. And I'll get started on my peaches. You call me for lunch. I shall. And a half pint of brandy. Oh, it seems like a lot of brandy. Oh, well. Mother. Oh, oh Jack. You've done it again. Done what? <laughs> snuck up on me with my hands full. Do you realize I almost dropped a whole cup of your father's best brandy? Oh, uh, sorry. I'm making those brandied peaches. Jack, what's the matter? You look pale. Do I? Very pale. You look worn out. What is it? I saw him. You saw... Whom did you see? You know, the murderer. You mean you went to the jail? I told you I was going. But they... They let you in to see him? There was nothing to it. I walked right into his cell, I talked to him, and then they let me out and I came home. It was that easy? Of course, nothing to it. What... What did you talk to him about? What I told you. I asked him how he felt. What did he say about how he felt? He said he felt fine. He felt fine. He didn't feel guilty or remorseful or, or anything. He said the killing was the only thing in his life he felt good about. Oh, he couldn't have meant that. Oh, yes, he did. You should have heard him. He said it was his first manly act. That's what he called it. Manly. Well, it hardly seems possible. He said he'd never felt so much like himself. In fact, he said it was the only time he'd felt like himself. His true self, he said. Well, it's very strange. It's a... That's a strange way to talk. He's a age. A little older than maybe a year or two. He's got brown eyes and brown hair. And he sat there looking at me right in the eye and telling me that the murder was the crowning achievement of his life. He didn't mean it. If you heard him, you wouldn't say that. Yes. He meant it all right. He really meant it. He upset you, didn't he? It wasn't exactly what I'd hoped he'd say. Why don't you go upstairs and lie down for a bit? I'll call you when she's ready. I think I'll do that. Yes, I, I think I'll do that. Call me for lunch. I will. Now, get a little rest. You hear me? Yes, I hear <sighs> Joseph... It's me. I have to talk to you. Well, come in, dear. 
Joe, they let him in. They let him in. The warden let Jack in to see that man. He did? Well, I must say I'm very surprised and not at all pleased. Joe, that's not the worst of it. It's what the man said to Jack. What did he say? Why, incredible things. He said that the killing was the only manly act of his life, the only thing he ever felt good about, his crowning achievement. My word. Joe, he said it was his first manly act. <laughs> Perhaps for him it was. Why, Joe, how can you talk like that? Well, I didn't say I considered the manly act. I said it's quite possible that he did. Well, I wish that he hadn't chosen it to say to our son. Jack said that he showed no remorse whatsoever. Can you imagine? Well, why should he show remorse if he didn't feel any? Oh. Well, I simply don't understand you at all. I really don't. Well, he was very badly treated by the man he killed. And that's an excuse for murder? I, I declare I'm beginning to see Jack's point. You should have sentenced him to death if that's his attitude. Why, if, if everybody felt that way, if everybody spent his life getting even with everybody who was unkind... Not everybody, Helen. Well, I... All I know is that Jack is very upset. He came home as though he'd been rocked to his very soul. He was... He was not himself at all. Where is he now? Well, I told him to go upstairs and then lie down for a while, and he said he thought he would. Joe... Don't be unkind to him. Please. I won't be unkind. I, I know that you've been terribly annoyed with him these past few weeks, keeping after you all the time about the trial, about, about the sentence, but... At the moment, I'm a lot more annoyed with the warden at the prison. Letting Jack talk to that man. I can't imagine what he was thinking of. Look. You go back to your kitchen. I'm going to call the warden and chew him out a little. All right. And don't forget... When Jack comes downstairs, be kind to him. Don't worry, I'll be kind. Good. Come in. Oh, Jack. Come in. You're busy. Oh, no, no, not at all. I was going to make a phone call, but uh, I can wait. Sit down, son. I think I'd rather stand up, if you don't mind. Um, your mother just told me that you went to the jail. Yes, to see the man. And they let you see him? Of course. I walked right in. Oh, come now. It's not that easy to see any prisoner, let alone a convicted murderer. Well, it was for me. I can't really say that I approve. Of your going there in the first place. And in the second place, I very strongly disapprove of the warden letting you in. And I'm very unhappy about what the man said to you. Mother told you? Yes. I was going to tell you myself, because I wanted you to see what you've done. What I've done? You let a murderer live. If he kills somebody else, it'll be your fault. You turned him oh, loose. Now, Jack, I didn't turn him loose. On the phone. I let it ring. What? Never mind about the phone. Mother will answer it in the kitchen. I suppose she will. You and I have got something more important to take care of. Now, Jack, that... That's not a gun you have there, is it? It's a gun, all right. Well, put it down. For heaven's sake. I told you. I told you a month ago what a terrible thing you were doing. And you went ahead and did it, Jack. Jack. Joseph, the telephone. Helen, be careful. What is it? Are you all right? I'm, I'm all right. Jack! 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 Oh, my Lord, Jack! I told you. Didn't I tell you? Joseph. Joseph, has he gone mad? Joseph, is our son mad? <laughs> What is madness? When does the moment arrive when it is wholly evident? Who is to call it madness? And who is to call it revelation? How long may it last? And can it ever go away? Does it hide? Or is it imprisoned? Or is it disguised in a million minor ways? Till the day when it springs into full view. 
And when it appears, who is to recognize it and call it madness? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. It's a great mistake to think of all young people as radical and all their parents as conservative. The story we are presenting here concerns a judge who chose to spare the life of an acknowledged murderer and his son who passionately asserted that the man should be put to death. So passionate was his conviction that he was driven to threatening his father with a gun. And a few moments ago, we heard shots. Shots from the gun held by the judge's son. Orton Keys, yeah? Who? Judge Bailey? What? Yes, yes. Ask him to come right in. Oh, what on earth are you supposed to... Oh, come in, Judge. Come on in. Thank you, Warden. Will you uh, have a chair? Thank you. I should have phoned you before barging in like this, but... Oh, there's no harm Warden done. Keys. Why, in the name of common sense, did you let my son see that man? Now, wait a minute, Judge Bailey. At least I... you could have called and asked me. Well, I did call you. You certainly did not. I did, and your wife answered the phone. She told me you were working in your study and she didn't want to disturb you. What in the world was the idea of letting but I him... I didn't. Jack never saw the man. He... He didn't? No. He seemed very disturbed when he showed up here. Not normal at all. And he couldn't give me any logical reason why he should be allowed to talk to the man. So, of course, I... I didn't give my permission. Uh, no one else could have let him... No, go? no. My word is law here, Judge. Well, I owe you an apology, wouldn't he? Well, not at all. It's perfectly all right. But, uh, what made you think that Jack did talk to the man that he say he had? Well, he told his mother some story. She told me. I... I should have checked right away instead of... Well, no matter now, I, I do apologize, Wooden. You know, Judge Bailey, I, uh... I might have let him in just because he's your son. I say, might have. Except that he was so... so overwrought. Plus the fact that he had a gun. It was in his pocket, very poorly concealed. We spotted it the minute he walked in. Your son doesn't know too much about guns, I take it. I, I didn't even know he had one. You know, they're easy enough to pick up, unfortunately. Of course, I asked him what he planned to do with it. What did he say? Told me it was none of my business, and then he ran out of here. That was when I called you and talked to your wife, and, well, as I told you. Yes. And I did call back several times, but we always got a busy signal. I suppose your wife must have left the phone off the hook. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, she, she, she must have. I figured uh, something happened, and she just forgot. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Uh, something happened. Uh, she, she forgot Warden Keys, I'm going to ask a favor of you, a, a great favor. If you feel you can't grant it, please say so, and I'll understand. Oh, anything you do, Judge Bailey, I will do. I want to talk to this man. Ah, well, now, wait a minute. I, I know I shouldn't I... ask, and, and I wouldn't, except that, well, it's terribly important to me. I, uh... I won't ask to see him for more than, oh, you know, five minutes, perhaps. It, it, it shouldn't take more than that. And I don't know, I really... It's more important to me than I can probably explain, Warden. I, I wish I could explain, but at the moment I can't. Uh, perhaps one day, I, I don't know. Hmm. Five minutes. Not a second longer. All right, where would you like to talk to him? Any place at all, in, in his cell. Or... Look, if you're afraid he'll do me some harm... Oh, is that it? You, you're afraid he might attack me? Oh, no. Seeing as you're the man who spared his life, well, I don't... Even so, if, if you think he's dangerous, I, I'm willing to chance that. I mean, it's that important to me. I don't consider him dangerous at all. I think this murder is probably the only crime he'll ever commit. You mean that? Sure, it was a crime of passion, pure and simple. I think he'll make trusty within a year. Really? Most of our trustees are murderers. Didn't you know that? I never really thought about it. Oh, not the uh, the professional killers or the psychotic ones, but the 
The one-time murderers, where the stress and strain of their particular situation simply overwhelmed them, where the buried holiday suddenly surfaced, and as a rule, just as suddenly subsided, never to surface again. It's interesting. Well, now, how would you like to see this man right here in my office? Could I? Five minutes? Have my word. Okay. You know, I'd like to know sometime what you think of him. Personally, I like him. You stay right here. I'll have him brought in. You uh, know who I am. I, I, I should, don't you think? Oh, yes, it was a silly thing to say. Look, we only have five minutes. I, I promised the warden. So if you don't mind, I'd like to come straight to the point. Yes, sure, okay. I, uh, I have a son about your age. He uh, didn't agree with the 20 to life I give you. He he thought you should have been given the death penalty. Oh, really? He, uh, he, his name is Jack. Jack grew really exercised about it as the trial went on. Very, very vehement. It got so, I avoided speaking to him for fear he'd bring it up. I, I, I didn't want to argue with him, and I didn't want him to take the chance of influencing me in the slightest. Huh? I guess you've earned your reputation. I mean, like, you really are a good judge. I actually barred him from the courtroom on the day I handed down my decision. And it made him even more, more agitated, more hostile. And then came the day, you'd been locked up here about a month, I guess, when he told his mother that he was going to come here to see you. Yeah, what for? I, I don't know precisely. To see how you were... Reacting to the to the crime, I guess. He never saw me. So the warden just told me. But Jack came home and told his mother that he had seen you. And that you were cool as a cucumber about the whole thing. <laughs> Not quite. That you'd never felt so much like a man as when you killed your father. That it's the only thing you ever felt good about. Where could he have gotten such an idea? Oh, I, yeah, I couldn't say for sure, but maybe because that's exactly the way I do feel about it. You mean that? Yeah, sure. No, no remorse, none, none at all. Well, I'd, I'd rather not be here, of course, and and I know I shouldn't have taken a man's life, but but like deep inside, deep in, I really care to look at the moment. I I, I know that my whole life had been like. Leading up to the killing. And it wasn't even that killing, the killing of that man, I mean. It was, it was like, it was the killing of my own father. Uh, you don't mean you, you act. No, no, I didn't kill my own father, though I, though I wanted to. I couldn't do it because I was only four years old when he took me to the orphanage and left me there. He never said he was coming back for me, but <laughs> I always believed he would. I went on believing for well, for a long time. And when this other man took you out of the orphanage... Oh, I pretended to myself my father had come for me. Of course, the pretense didn't work. Pretenses never do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something that I... Uh, I'd, I'd rather you didn't repeat to anyone. Okay? I, uh, I have your word. You sure you need it? You got it? The warden wouldn't let Jack see you because... Well, I guess it's against regulations, but besides that, Jack had a gun on him. He came home after the warden had turned him down, and he he came into my study where I was working, and he reproached me again for, for letting you live, and he... he fired a shot at me. His mother came into the room at that moment, told me about the phone call, and... He turned the gun on himself. Oh, no. Mind you, no one knows about this. Yeah, but I mean, like, it'll come out, won't it? How he died. Well, he, he, isn't, he isn't dead. He's wounded. He's in the hospital. But he'll live. Now, can you tell me why he'd have done such a thing? 
I mean, I realize you can't possibly know. Not not really, but but I'd like your opinion. Me? Okay, all right. For what it's worth. I think that you know, brooding about me, what I'm done. Your son read my feelings accurately. Now, whether this was thought transference or telepathy or whatever, I don't know too much about those things. But he discovered that this desire to kill the father is a a, a universal wish. But I, I always thought my son loved me. Oh, he does. I'm sure he does. But that doesn't alter the other feeling, does it? I mean, it, it could keep it from, like surfacing, but it doesn't really alter it. Nothing does. Nothing can. It, it, it's hard for me to accept the fact that that my son died to kill me. Oh, but he didn't, don't you see? You, you, no, you, you, you mustn't think that. He, he was standing right close to you, wasn't he, when he fired the shots? Well, about uh, six feet away. Uh, yeah, and you weren't moving, were you? You, you weren't trying to stop him? Well, I was... I was too astonished and and perhaps too afraid. So you were a perfect target, weren't you? Well, I suppose. Uh, yes, I was. And, and yet he missed you completely, didn't he? Yes. Well, Judge, anyone who could miss a stationary target at six feet, he, he just didn't want to hit it. So he only succeeded in... The only thing himself. Am I right? Thank you. From the bottom of my heart. For all you said. No. Thank you, sir. For my life. Hello, son. How are you? Coming along okay? I guess. That's what the doctors tell me. Father, lying here thinking, trying to think, I can't understand how it all happened. It's all right. I was out of my mind. That's the only way I can figure it. Don't you think so? I think something like that. It won't ever happen again. Oh, Jack. We went to see the man in jail, the murderer. Why'd you take a gun with you? Oh, yes. The gun. Did you mean to kill him with it? Oh, no. No, no. Did you think you'd do what I hadn't done? Take his life? No. See, I thought he'd be so... so remorseful. I thought he'd be eaten up with remorse and guilt and sorrow for what he'd done. I thought he wouldn't want to live. So I thought I'd just hand him the gun and he'd do the rest. By that, you mean... I thought he'd kill himself. But I never got to see him. Did I? No. Funny. I thought, well, I did see him. And we talked a little bit. And he was arrogant. And he wasn't sorry at all. It was very clear to me at the time. Now, now I'm not so sure. Rest, son. It'll all come clear one day, son. Thou shalt not kill. This simple, terse statement is in the book of Exodus. It is not followed by the word except or the word unless or any qualifying phrase. No, it reads plainly, thou shalt not kill. We might ask why the Lord thought it necessary to deliver this stern injunction. Can it be for any other reason but that the impulse to kill lies fermenting silently in every human heart. I'll be back shortly. You're on the open road, rolling free and feeling great about your new Buick Century. Because in published EPA mileage test results, a V6 Buick Century got the best highway mileage of any U.S. mid-sized car. 24 miles per gallon and 16 in the city. Your Century's comfortable, it's nimble, it's economical, and above all... It's a Buick. Living free. Hi, I'm Burl Ives. 
You know, nothing perks up a meal like an exciting side dish. And I'd like to tell you about one your family and your guests are sure to love and keep on loving. It's Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice. It's a mouth-watering mixture of Uncle Ben's converted bran rice, wild rice herbs, and seasonings. It's the kind of side dish that can make an ordinary meal a great meal and can keep a great meal from becoming ordinary. In fact, Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice is so good, they tell me that most everyone who tries it comes back for more. That's because there are no compromises in quality, but that's the way Uncle Ben's does business. So, to make an ordinary meal a great meal, try Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice. And to make sure you get the quality ingredients and good taste I've told you about, make sure it's Uncle Ben's. This is Shelley Henry with one of the most crucial and provocative issues of our day. The question of government. Is it adequate for the problems that it has to solve? That's Monday at 2.15. Dear listeners, I hope we have not saddened you with our account of the darker side of man's nature. If we have... Let me leave you with these lovely words from the book of Psalms. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Our cast included William Prince, Augusta Dabney, Christopher Tabori, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact the 12-hour cold capsule, and Uncle Ben's long grain and wild rice. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>